a hundred invited guests have gathered to sample the new lager. The kegs began flowing about an hour and a half ago. I've heard a lot of comments so far. One person says it's better than Coors. Another person says it tastes just like an American beer. Somebody else said, well, this is the kind of a taste that I could get accustomed to. Now, Bill Critch. Bill, yes. he's a Boeing engineer. Hello, Bill. Hello. You were the first person to taste this lager tonight here at this party. What did you think of it? Well, it's a, it's a rather unique brew. Uh, it's kind of bitter, and but a little bit sweet, and it uh, has a good taste. Is this something you'd buy? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I'd buy it. And you know your beer? Yes, I was raised in Australia. We like beer down there. Drink a lot of it. As you know, you know, guzzling beer can be an art. And earlier today, uh, I had a conversation with a beer connoisseur. And you know, he told me pretty much that there is more to life than just drinking Budweiser, for example. Meet beer expert Charles Finkel, who has marketed international beers locally for seven years. Finkel wants to educate Seattle about brew. So let's take a lesson. Authentic beer is made of water, malted barley, which is roasted. The darker the roast, the darker the beer. Hops, which is the seasoning and natural preservative and yeast, which ferments the mixture. American mass-marketed beers uh, are produced from 60% malted barley, generally, and 40% filler. They politely call that adjunct, but that is generally corn grits or rice extract, designed not to have any flavor or any taste or any character, but to give beer uh, uh, fermentable solids just as, uh, as uh, certain uh, breads uh, contain something other than, than flour and certain cheeses, uh, things other than dairy product. You think American beer is comparable to Wonder Bread and... It's the Velveeta cheese of the, the beer world, absolutely. Because of... Because of the fact that, that, that it's made with 60% uh, of what it should be made from and 40% of what uh, it is less expensive than that. But just like wine, there are different kinds of wines depending on the grape. There are actually different styles of beer depending on the recipe. There are approximately 15 classic styles of, of wine, different taste characteristics, and there are approximately 25 different classic styles of beer. Pale ale, porter, abbey ale, copper ale, double bock beer, scotch ale, nut brown ale, oatmeal stout, wheat beer, those are all different styles of beer. And the way to learn about beer is to not drink one from Norway and one from Germany, but to drink beers based on how do they taste. The same way that you learn about cheese, you try a Brie and a Port Salute and a Roadford, or about wine, you try a Cabernet and a Chardonnay and a Zinfandel. Each of those tastes different because they're made to different recipes with different grapes in the case of the wine. Finkel says beer should be served cool, never frozen, never heated. Well it does not have to breathe, and it off. should be poured into the middle of the glass. Pour beer generally straight up. And uh, it took the brewer a long time. This is a cherry beer made on, uh, on uh, the Lindemann's farm in Belgium. It took the brewer a long time to put the, the uh, carbonation, what we call the head, in there. So you should take a while to pour the beer. Don't try to do it all in one one uh, pour. Now most people pour the bottle. They sort pour of pour it like this. Right. And what that does they is it... They try to eliminate it, the head. They try to eliminate the head, but the head, as you can see, is both aesthetically beautiful. It, uh, I think it's sort of fun to uh, sensual to, to put your mouth to. Delicious. And uh, it really uh, releases the carbonation from the beer if you pour it straight up, and it makes the beer less bloating. And which countries brew the best beer? Our expert says Germany, England, and Belgium. And the worst? Well, that brings us to the subject of lights. What about light beers? Let's take Miller Lite. I wouldn't drink that. Uh, that's a beer that's, that's made with, uh, with very little uh, of what beer is traditionally made with. It's beer really by name, but classically you couldn't call it a beer. It has no taste, in my opinion. It has and 39 ingredients? It has, it's made with, uh, they say, as many as 39 ingredients. Classic beer, according to German purity law, has four ingredients. So what are the other The other 30? ones are additives, chemicals, preservatives. Toast it up. Great. Here we go. Here is a toast to the new Thomas Kemper beer. Yes, it's pretty loud.
crowd. And now Lori has a story about the new brewing company. Lori? Thanks a lot, Linda. The newest entry in the microbrew market is from a two-month-old Bainbridge Island company, the only small company brewing lager west of the Mississippi. Tonight, a Bainbridge Island secret, known only to patrons of selected taverns and eateries, becomes known in Seattle. Thomas Kemper Lager. Okay, so the brewery is no Rainier beer plant, but that's what makes the brew special. Chemical engineer turned brewmaster Will Kemper, his wife Mari, and their partner Andy Thomas can only brew 25 kegs per week. Lager takes five weeks to brew versus ale, which can be trucked out after only two weeks. Once I got into it, then I got into the chemistry behind it. Uh, and and uh, as Mari was saying, it, it, there are a lot of similarities to cooking. Now, beer making as opposed to wine making, uh, there's a lot of thermodynamics and, and heat, uh, heating involved in it. So that's uh, a different concern than, you know, the, the wineries. And, you know, and now since we're doing a lager, then there's a lot of um, cooling. Well, I feel like you always have to go for your dream. If you never go for your dream, you'll never, you'll never feel like your life has really been completed or that you've done what you wanted to do in your life. And this is something he's always wanted to do more than anything else. Most of the equipment was bought cheap from local dairies and jerry-rigged to brew beer. It took Will about three years to hit upon the perfect lager recipe. The secret to a good tasting beer? Use few additives. Use yeast cultures from England. Make sure it has a pleasant bouquet. And taste it cold, fresh out of the keg. Um, it's clear enough, yeah. Uh, to make it super clear, you'd have to add silica, silica to do it. It's called a chill haze. Can you smell it being fragrant? Mm -hmm. now, Very to, good. To okay, get the that... fragrance morsel on, it suggests it's just swirl it like that. The Kempers want to increase production this year to 75 kegs a week. Although it will mean hard work, they say brewing is fun. Why, even their phone number is playful. It's 842-SUDS. For you real aficionados out there, Thomas Kemper is a Hell's Munchner lager. Pardon my German. Well, when you talk about beer in this area, you think about big outfits like Olympia and Rainier. But Charlotte Rainer reports that's not all that's been brewing here. That's next on Top Story. <laughs> You probably named two, the old Olympia Brewery and Rainier. In fact, there are little specialty breweries all over the place. Besides the new Kemper Brewery on Bainbridge, there's Red Hook in Seattle, Pyramid Ale in Kalama, and another in Vancouver, Kufner's in Monroe, Hale's Ale in Colville, and Grant's in Yakima. Consumer trends encourage the specialty brewers. Consumers started walking right past all those similar tasting national brands and went for the imports. And that signaled their interest in something different. So why not offer them something fresh and different? The Red Hook Brewery in Ballard was the first to open in Seattle in 1982, selling only fresh beer in kegs. Business has been good. In the last year, our uh, volume of kegs is up about one third from a year ago. And from when we started, it's almost double. The market is growing. There's a lot of new small breweries in Washington State. And uh, we're just uh, trying to keep up with the growth rate. Uh, it's probably growing at about 25% uh, a year. The small local breweries take advantage of locally grown hops, plenty of good water, and a high rate of consumption by fresh beer lovers. As a matter of fact, the only people in the country who drink more draft beer than Washingtonians live in Oregon. Even though this tavern owner charges 50 cents more for a glass of local Red Hook, people buy it, and he wouldn't think of not stocking it. Well, I, I think it fills a need that the people who want Red Hook don't want the other. Uh, they, they probably would look until they found something comparable. I think that's why the proliferation of all of the small breweries today, that people want to change. This is a market that's just being tapped, so to speak, and the local beer producers don't even advertise. In Seattle, Charlotte Rayner,
top story. The successful marketing of beer, however, just isn't possible without some advertising. Greg Palmer looks at one aspect of that story when we come back. Illusions are now showing. Under their spell, you will believe that a visitor from another planet has arrived, cloned himself into human form to begin a romantic odyssey on Earth. like her dead husband. What does he want from her? Better, what can he give? Or break through the barriers of space and time and enter the world of doom. An incredible secret has been kept on this planet. Many dangers exist on Arrakis. Both sides of the imagination are at war on doom. The incredible nightmares of evil and the dream of ultimate victory for the good. Now, a musical fantasy. I can save you. Playing forbidden love. Try me. To the beat of bullets. You sing real life. What is it? Jazz. The Cotton Club is a kaleidoscope of sound and images spinning out classic movie make-believe about gangsters, lovers, and music. Oh, wait a minute, Eddie. You don't really think that old trick's gonna work. We're not gonna fall for a banana and a tailpipe. You're not gonna fall for the banana and the tailpipe? <laughs> it should be more natural, though. It should flow out. Look, man, I ain't falling for no banana in my tailpipe. Unbelievable that a Detroit cop could come to the land of make-believe and outfox the Beverly Hills cops. If you believe that, then you'll believe Goldie Hawn as a diplomat. Hi, Grandma, if you're watching. What is this cornball routine? This is a real natural high for me. Imagine a cocktail waitress serving protocol. Fantastic. Okay, Goldie, show us how to greet the queen. Perhaps she's not as unintelligent as you seem to think. Sponsored by Now Showing. Happy Holidays. The fun can't be beat on Tic Tac Doe. Wink Martindale brings you the hottest half hour on television. Join the winners on Tic Tac Doe. Weeknights at 7.30 on King 5. There's a big fight brewing over beer ads on television. Critics say they encourage young people to drink, and they want the government to tighten restrictions on ads. The beer industry says ads are essential for survival in a market where more brands are competing for fewer customers. The industry spends $560 million on TV ads, and the search for ingenious ways to sell beer goes on. Greg Palmer visited the creators on one of the most ingenious campaigns ever. Here's his report. Up above a religious book and game store down at the non-trendy end of Western Avenue are the offices of Heckler Associates. Originally a creative service, Heckler is a full-service advertising agency now, but they are still most famous for strictly a creative job. A very creative job. They're out there, Willis! Let's go! For several years, I thought that we should be doing something that was uh, a derivative of cowboy movies or cowboy TV programs, or at least cowboys, hurting the giant bottles. The boss didn't find that very interesting. It wasn't funny enough or strange enough. So he came up with the idea of giant living rooms that are movable being the vehicles that are hurting the bottles instead of people on horses. Ed Leinbacher has written and produced the Rainier commercials with his Heckler Associates Associates for 10 years now. He talks about funny and strange the way other ad men talk about item and price. In the mystery and suspense genre, and I would add, in advertising, a tongue-in-cheek irreverence is indispensable. Rainier has often elevated parody to new heights of facetiousness. I well are for an RBQ, aren't it? Yes, it are. There are some people that hate that, but I think the bulk of the public really loves that spot. And came Halloween, for example, there were people wearing our heads all over the <laughs> all over the Northwest. If nobody reacts at all, I don't think you're doing your job. If it's uh, if it's 90% favorable and 
unfavorable, I'd say that must be really good. Of the hundred some commercials, many are parodies for no particular reason other than Leimbacher and company's affection for parodies. Some are completely original concepts, and a few, like the sweet spoken light beer drinking housewife, are classics. But you know, you don't need to be macho to enjoy Rainier Light. Hey, Marlene, give me another beer. Get it yourself, Bob! Unlike most Rainier beer commercial watchers, Ed Leimbacher doesn't have any favorites. By the time he's produced them, he's bored with them. But when he talks about the giant running bottles, the only recurring theme in the spots over the 10 years, a certain wistful affection is obvious. We've still not ever had them captured. They're still wild bottles. They've not ever been captured and tapped. Greg Palmer, Top they Story. They represent a growing business in Washington State, microbreweries. After a 40-year hiatus, mom-and-pop beers are back and growing fast in Washington. That story next on Evening Edition. It's a beer lover's fantasy come true. Today, more than a dozen different beers are brewed in Washington State. Four years ago, none of these handcrafted local beers existed. Washington's microbreweries began springing up in 1982, in part because a state law adopted that year increased the allowable alcohol content of beer to 5%. Once the alcohol limit was raised, microbrewers felt they could outdo the popular imports for flavor and freshness. Among the first to take advantage of the new law was Red Hook Brewery in Ballard, founded by company president Paul Shipman. The old law was an obstacle because all the beers had to be under 4% in alcohol content. When you make an all malt beer under 4% al uh, alcohol content, you're limited as to the range of bodies and, uh, and the fullness and character that you can have in the beer. We compete with the imports uh, in terms of price, but you're paying for hand work rather than ocean shipping. Red Hook brews about 200 kegs each week with the help of six full-time workers. The process is done entirely by hand from the moment water and barley are mixed in this copper brew kettle to the time the beer is pumped into kegs and delivered. Brew foreman Rick Buchanan examines, measures, and tastes each batch to ensure its quality. He learned brewing as an apprentice but he also brought with him a unique blend of experience. I was a, a chef for uh, uh, many years, and, and I, I quit that and went into pipe fitting. And essentially, those, those two things gave me a good background in building a, a brewery. Red Hook's business transactions are handled by Shipman, who has a master's degree and experience in Washington's wine industry. He's also the company's main salesman. I go out every day and call on at least uh, four establishments that pour uh, uh, one or more specialty beers. And usually at least three of those are existing customers, but I also prospect every day. And um, that, uh, that helps. Despite such efforts, brewers like Shipman present no serious competition to large beer makers. All of the nation's 26 microbreweries together share only 1% of beer sales in the country. One thing that limits microbrew sales is the fact that almost all of them are available on draft only. But as the popularity of handcrafted beers grows, brewers are responding by bottling their beers. Red Hook Ale and Ballard Bitters are already being bottled at the Ballard Brewery. The consumers who uh, sampled our beers and, and loved our beers in taverns and restaurants around Seattle uh, demanded that there was a way to take it home. Now, it's good business for us. Our, our share of the bottle market inside the city is about two one-hundredths of one percent. Um, uh, but it's a very big part of our business. The brewers at Thomas Kemper Lager also hope to see their beer in bottles one day, but for now, they're primarily concerned with brewing a memorable beer. They dote on each of the 40 kegs made every week in this small Bainbridge Island warehouse, 
And Will Kemper believes it's that hands-on process that makes his beer and other micro-brews comparable to a gourmet meal. A filet mignon, for example. Uh, a McDonald's can't do a filet mignon very well. We, a brewery, a large brewery, cannot do a, very, a beer like we do very well. Now, a lot of people are satisfied with going to a chain restaurant, and are satisfied going to an American-style beer, but there's still a lot of people that want to go to specialty restaurants and want to drink specialty beers. Washington State has become a mecca for those who enjoy the new handcrafted beers. A fourth of the nation's microbreweries are located here, close to abundant supplies of good water and acres of hops and barley, all essential ingredients for beer. This high concentration of brewers is both beneficial and challenging for the tiny companies. There is much, a, a much larger market here, and because the small brewer is here, it seems to, it seems to create more interest. Seattle is like the Napa uh, Valley of specialty beers. So we, uh, in this uh, city, and this is the only place in the country where it's occurring, the uh, specialty brewers knock heads. Micro brewers also hope to mimic the success of small American wineries by providing a fresh tasting beverage that could displace the imports over the next five years. For Evening Edition, I'm Susie Hedrick. Yeah, drink it right now.